Welcome to The Rankings Podcast, where we feature top founders, entrepreneurs, and elite personal injury attorneys, and share their inspiring stories. Now, let's get started with the show. Chris Schreier here, president and founder of Rankings.io, where we help elite personal injury attorneys dominate first page rankings. You're listening to the Rankings Podcast, where I feature top business owners, entrepreneurs, and of course, elite personal injury attorneys. Speaking of top business owners, I have Alvaro Ruiz, founder of 3A Law Management. 3A Law Management is a business consulting firm helping lawyers grow their practices through operations, processes, marketing, technology, case management, and more. Alvaro has worked with the country's top firms in near, nearly every practice area, making him the ultimate law practice management consultant. He has been awarded Daily Reports Hall of Fame, Best, of Bi Best Business Coach, and numerous other awards. Alvaro, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. I appreciate it. Yeah, happy to have you on here. So, you know, let's get started for everybody listening, you know, that, that's wondering what, what are the three A's? What are the three A's in 3A law management? Sure. Yeah. So it's actually two things. Uh, my initials are AAA. And um, at the end of legal documents, you always put the initials. And I just didn't like the three A's because I don't tow cars or fix cars. So um, they're my initials. And then also it's awareness, aptitude and accountability. And that's really the, the cornerstone of, of the business where it's awareness is I feel if I if I have knowledge, I can make an educated, confident decision. And so I've been doing this 23, 20 some odd years. And so and we work all over the country. And so what I want to do is just give clients the awareness of the cliff, the short version. Oh, you want to try this? Well, here are the pros, cons, um, cost benefits, what to expect, what kind of technology you'll need, what kind of people you'll need. And then if they want to pull out and go down another rabbit hole, pros, cons. And so just enabling them to make a better decision. And then the second A is aptitude. Once we know what we're building, it's a matter of what are the steps? What do I have to do today? How do I do it? What do I have to do tomorrow? How do I do that? How do I know if I'm doing it right? So it's giving you the actual steps to implement. And then the third A is accountability. It's making sure you accomplish the goals that we set out at the beginning and helping you get to that point where you have a quality of life balance. So those are my three A's, awareness, aptitude, and accountability. Yeah, I love that. And, and I love the accountability part, right? So you can read and read, you can, you can get mentored, and, and, but it, it comes down to execution too. So, Absolutely. Absolutely, you know, yeah. Yeah, so, so take me back you know, you've got 20 years experience in this. How did you start? How did, how did this become a focus and sure. especially? Yeah. Uh, well, I always say I just made it up. Uh, my dad, I was going to be a doctor and I used to work with my dad in his medical clinic. So I knew how to run a medical clinic and then wanted to be a dropped out, wanted to be a writer instead and met a lawyer here in Atlanta who was a solo and she'd been in business for a while doing family law. And I got in there to review some boilerplate language. And then I said, well, why aren't you running it like this? Or why aren't you doing this? And she said, well, I didn't know you're supposed to do that. I wasn't taught that in law school. And so I said, well, let me help you with this. And long story short, within five years, we opened four offices, 20 staff, 15 attorneys. She essentially semi-retired at 40. And so other attorneys started asking me for help. Hey, I saw what you did for her. Can you help me? And it was aspects of technology it was you know going out on your own and they were still open you know the people that would leave the firm open their own shop five years down the road they're still open so it was working because i was giving them steps this is what you do first this is what you have to do in compliance this is what you have to do with your accounts this is what you have to do with marketing it's step-by-step -step process and then finally i started doing it part-time you know i had a really good gig i was making six figures months of vacation, not working full time. Uh, but there was this need. Lawyers uh, were either getting laid off or they wanted a better quality of life. And so I created this kit to help them launch. You know, if you want to go out on your own, this is everything you need to do. And so I just took a chance. There was nobody really doing it in the legal field. There were a lot of coaches, but there was nothing that said, what do I do on Monday? And how do I know if I'm doing it efficiently? And what do I have my paralegal do? And how do I know if that's right? And 
when is it time to hire somebody and how do I know how I'm doing compared to other people? And so I just saw the void and then created that startup kit for lawyers. Um, it kind of backfired <laughs> um, because that's right also when, when I went full time was right when the economy tanked, it was in 08. Yep. And, and so everyone was getting laid off and there was going to be this missing class of, Oh, Emory graduated, you know, 95% found jobs within six months. And then it was 70%. Then it was 40%. There was going to be that missing class. Um, but nobody wanted to go out on their own. And so my first year, I think I had maybe three clients and was really questioning uh, what I was doing. Uh, also because I don't have a graduate degree. I thought because I wasn't a lawyer, because I thought I needed to go get an MBA in business for them to respect me or to listen to me, um, to have long hair. And so, you know, I really thought, I really questioned maybe this wasn't the right idea, but um, established firms started looking for me and they said, hey, we just made it through. We had to let some people off, but we can't go through that again. Help us be more efficient, help us market and be more profitable. And so I really started just branching out with existing firms and, and helping them kind of rebuild after that 08 uh, disaster. So, yeah, yeah, I, lo I, I love that there's ton tons of nuggets there. So, you know, one of the things you know, I, I see a lot of individuals, they'll highlight, you know, social proof and, and they'll highlight, uh, you know, the awards and things like that that's seen in. But, but ultimately, the best form of social proof is when someone else says that you're exceptional. Hey, he provided these results for me. Yeah. So, you know, was it? Yeah. Okay. Did it start, did that momentum pick up when you started to develop these evangelists for your, for your services? And that's, and that it really, I think maybe about, Six years ago, there was really that kind of turning point where, because we don't advertise every, you know, 90%, if not more, are referrals. Hey, I heard about you. Hey, my friend used you. Um, and then the other 10% is from speaking around the country for, you know, the different uh, bar sections. And so just all that momentum just finally caught up about, I feel like six years ago. And it was just, you know, you have faith that it's going to happen and that people are going to put out a good word for you if you do good work. And, uh, and it just did, it just started getting, Hey, I'm in Montana. I heard about you or, Hey, I saw you speak, you know, in Vegas, I'm in Oklahoma. And it just kind of, you know, I got a buddy in San Francisco. Can you help him? And it just snowballed. Yeah. And, and for me, so I heard you speak at game changer summit. I, I was, uh, you were truly an expert. Like there, there, it was very clear. You're very knowledgeable on the topics. And I was like, I, I have to have you on the show. And, you know, so you've worked with these, you've helped develop attorneys into these elite attorneys and, and grow practices. And, you know, so let, let's talk about what are some of these, you know, big 80, 20 principles or processes that these large firms are doing that, that take them to the next level that are helping them scale. So I think it's, it's, it's in three parts. Um, you know, the first part is having the right processes in place, um, making sure, because what happens is when you do it yourself, you know how you want it done. And then the key to growth is delegation. You have to be able to delegate. Otherwise, you're, you're going to stay stagnant. And so what stops people from delegating is, well, they don't do it like I do it, or it took them twice as long, or they don't, they don't get it, right? And so I say, well, have you taken the time to communicate what you want done, how you want it done, how their behavior impacts the success of the firm? And eight out of 10 say no. And the ones that say yes are the ones that are able to scale and delegate to more and more people because they have their processes in place. Uh, marketing is another key factor. You never, ever stop marketing. I always say market an hour a day, um, even if you're crushing it. Uh, if you're slow, you obviously have more time to market, but you never take your foot off of that pedal. And the clients who don't get lackadaisical about their business development are the ones that are just always trying to get to that next level. What I want to one up. And it's, and it's really fascinating, especially with, with what's happening now, how clients are reacting all over the country and obviously based on their practice area 
to this situation. And I have some guys who are actually really taking advantage of it from a marketing perspective. And I can tell their efforts are going to keep them through the, this slow time. Uh, and probably the last part is utilizing technology. Um, the ones that utilize technology, you can streamline your process. You can automate your marketing. You can get the critical analytics and data that you need to see if it's working or if you need to modify behavior. And when clients will say, hey, should I hire an attorney? And well, what are these metrics? And what are these metrics? And what are these metrics? Well, I don't know. Well, go figure it out. And then it takes them three or four hours to figure it out. They come back to me and they're like, okay, here they are. And I look at it. I'm like, no, you don't need to hire anybody yet. Right. And if you just wasted three or four hours, if you just press a, a button, see the report, you can make better decisions in real time. And so I think having processes, always marketing and utilizing technology, you know, to automate and streamline the practice are if you're doing one of those three things or all three of those things, you're really going to set yourself apart. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, you have to delegate, right? We, each of us, we only have so much time. We have to focus on our high value activities. I would say, you know, most of the elite attorneys, they end up being the, the, the brand. They, they have this personal brand that drives the business. They have to, they have to do a lot of marketing. So many times they end up delegating the, the, the case management type yeah. situations. And that's, and that's easier to, I guess, teach, you know, clients at, they sometimes get frustrated. Well, this person doesn't do it like I do, or they don't work the same hours that I do. And I have to stop and explain to them, there's a reason why you do what you do and, and they do what they do. If they were just like you, guess what? They would leave and open up their own practice. And so it's okay to recognize what everyone's role is. And so if you can just be okay with Mark, because nobody's going to sell the practice better than you. Nobody's going to have the same conviction, the same passion. And so that's one thing, marketing the practice, you can only delegate so much of that, you know, but ultimately it has to be your brand and your message that they're hearing. And that's not something your receptionist necessarily can, you know, advocate as well as you can. Yeah. You know, you know, it's funny. I, I hear Gary V talk about it. Like no one's going to care about your business as much as you do. You own it. You know, yeah. so when I see core values and individuals put like ownership mentality, that's the, you can't expect them to act like an owner. You know, you, you want can. them to be and, empowered, yeah. but. And so, and so it's a balance, right? You have to understand that they're not going to have that owner mentality and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And so just letting them know it's okay, but then explaining how they can contribute in their own way to that brand and to that message. And so I think, again, having that process is, this is how we touch our clients and this is why it's important to us, um, you know, to build that client campaign, to build that client, uh, you know, like you said, uh, what'd you call them, evangelists? Yeah, 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 or disciples, yeah. I mean, you need that stuff and so it's, it's important. Yeah, so, you know, in terms of, let's, you know, what are a few tips? So let's say, you know, you've got this attorney, he's just, he's buried in paperwork. He's, he's, he needs assistance. You know, what are some of the easy, maybe 80, 20 approach to process documentation for, to help him delegate? Sure. So what I, I say, which it, you know, it's kind of, it takes a couple of weeks to get to it, but track your time for, for two weeks you know, like from seven to eight, this is what I do from eight to nine. This is what I do. And what you're going to find is this is where the accountability starts up. Because if you're not starting till 1030, you're already you've already lost half of the day, right? So figuring out what you're doing all day. And then was that the best use of your time? I tell all my clients, assign yourself an hourly rate. I don't care if you're flat fee contingency, assign yourself an hourly rate and then multiply what you're doing during those two weeks and you're going to start seeing what was not the best you see i just spent you know if i bill 500 dollars an hour and i just spent three hours looking for a document that wasn't you know that's 1500 dollars. i could have gotten a scanner for 200 bucks an intern for 100 bucks and we could have a paperless office right and so really the first thing to do is figure out what you're doing 
And what are the top 10 things that was that were not the best use of your time? And when you find those 10 things, write down how you would handle them. Oh, this is how I would respond to an inquiry, or this is how I would process the mail, or this is how I would tell a client about a court date notice. And write that down, all your 10 processes, and then find somebody that can help you. It's not necessarily, you don't have to hire a full timer at $65,000. You can get an intern. If it's admin work, Look at the paralegal schools. They have interns that need hours. Go find them. If it's more, you know, attorney work, motions, discovery, research, go find a law student to intern. So it, you don't have to take it all on yourself. Just figure out, hey, for two weeks, I'm going to track my time. I'm going to sign myself an hourly rate and see what was not the best use of my time. And I would start there. I, I, I love that. You know, I think a lot of this ties into my next question is about finance and profitability. So, you know, sure. does, so, you know, you've got, you know, I've been there myself, you know, you, you, you start to get busy and you immediately think to hire and then you're just kind of treading water with profitability, right? You just keep carrying over. And, and so how, how do attorneys manage profitability and still maintain, you know, margins and, and, and avoid scope creep and things like that? Sure. So one of the key metrics is net profit margin. It's not about how much revenue we make. It's about how much is left when we're done paying all the expenses, right? So focusing on net profit margin and also knowing what's, an, what's a healthy profit margin for my practice area. You know, I can, I see criminal family, you know, some of your billables around 25, 30% net profit, which is still higher than most businesses. But then you also have your contingency practices, which run a lot higher because they get these pops every now and again. Eminent domain is probably the highest um, net profit margin practice area out there because it's so lightweight um, and yields so much uh, revenue that you're, you'll normally see something above 80% when you're dealing with eminent domain practices. And focusing on net profit margin also, it encourages you to market because that's where the revenue comes in from, but it also encourages you to track your expenses and to budget. So you don't go too crazy over hiring or overspending. Um, so I think keeping a healthy net profit, what's my goal? How do I increase it by 2%? If I've got, you know, attorneys that I'm encouraging to originate, tell them if you help me increase the net profit by 5%, then I'll give you an extra $10,000 or what have you. But focusing on net profit margin lets you stay aware of marketing, but also what the expenses are. Yeah, I, I like that. And you also brought in there some niching tactics, right? So, you know, uh, we, we focus with personal injury lawyers and that's, that's our niche and it, it helps us maximize our advertising expenditures. Cause I'm not just throwing pain against the wall. It's just yeah. going after personal injury attorneys. And you mentioned eminent domain. Well, they don't have near the amount of competition. So, you know, doing SEO, doing pay-per-click, it's gotta be substantially less than, you know, trying to bid for car accident lawyer. Absolutely. So, I mean, that brings up a good point. For me, it's, there's no magic answer for marketing. You know, it's not a specific spend. It's not a specific keyword. It's, it's, it's really just, what am I trying to accomplish? Where am I trying to get to? What's my practice area? And then reverse engineer it, right? And so if this is my practice area and I tend to get my highest value clients, you know, from this source, how do I build a campaign around it? So when you're thinking marketing, you're thinking about client cost acquisition, right? How much does it cost me to get this client? You're thinking about conversion ratio, meaning if the phone rings 10 times, am I gonna sign up three people or am I gonna sign up eight people, right? You wanna look at um, average case value. So if, you know, if it rings, 10 times and three of them higher and the case values are 5,000. Whereas over here, if we're doing something marketing wise and at a 10, eight sign up and the average case value is 15,000. Again, you start thinking about how am I making these decisions? So there's no magic answer to marketing. It's not anything on, you know, social or a spend or a keyword. It's, 
It's really what am I trying to get? What am I trying to accomplish? What am I trying to improve? And then how do I reverse engineer to get to that goal? So if you're at a million dollars and you're trying to get to 1.5 this year, you're short 500,000, you know? So divided by 12 months, then you're short that amount. And each case is worth this much, then that's divided. So it's really just, what's my goal? Is that realistic? And if so, how do I reverse engineer it? I, I love that. I love that. And you know, these, these are, these are all amazing tactics. And I, I want to go back to that, that last A, the, the accountability. So what are, what are the techniques or the tips that you're giving your clients to help them stay accountable to, to make these actions, to execute? Meetings, you know, and we don't have meetings just to have meetings. They're very focused. They're, they have an agenda and there's a frequency to them. And so as soon as you express that to everyone in your office, hey, we're having quarterly partner meetings and this is what we're talking. We're having bi-monthly marketing meetings and this is what we're talking about. We're having weekly team meetings and these, this is what we're talking about cases. We're having you know, bi-monthly financial meetings and this is what we're talking about. And so what happens is you have these meetings and they're aware of what's gonna be discussed at the meeting. And so it's either, oh crap, I need to hurry up and do it because they're gonna talk about it or I'm proud. Look, I have this information. How do we dissect it? And how do we make an actionable item out of it? And so having these meetings and sticking to them. So it's not just, you know, if, if the meetings are on Monday morning and you can't make it, then it's somebody's job to reschedule it to Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning. You don't skip the meeting. And so what happens is if you don't have these set agenda meetings, then people can get away with it, you know, and it's, and people will, and, and it's just the nature of humanity. So it's not to say you have bad employees, but if you're not keeping track of it and showing them that it's important, then they're not going to think it's important. And so that's why you have the meetings to enforce accountability. So, I love that. You know, it, it does. And it, and it shows who's, who's actually doing the work, right? So it puts them yeah. on the spot. And so, so with these meeting cadences, is it a situation? Is it different for every firm? Is it, is it's it different? Yeah, it's different. You know, well, some meetings are all the same financial marketing partner. Um, but it's your team meetings are going to fluctuate based on your practice area. But the idea is, Hey, here's 10, here's 10 things to do. This is how I want them done. Do you have any questions about how I want it done or the priority in that I want it done? Great, I'll see you next Monday and knock out these 10 things. Call me if you have any questions. The following Monday, did you do the 10 things? Great, now let's do another 10 things. Or I didn't do the 10 things, well why? Well, because this happened, this happened, COVID happened, right? And it's like, okay, well that makes sense. I'm gonna excuse why you only did five of the 10. Or you had plenty of time, there was no virus, there was all, you know, and you didn't do these 10 things. Now talk to me about how can you not do in your job. And so, you know, making sure that they know that you're going to talk to them about what's happening at the, at the meetings and what their weekly expectations are, I think helps, you know, keep the tight leash. Yeah, I love that. So, you know, you, you've developed these skills and these expertise over 20 years. So, you know, what are, what are some of your favorite business books uh, and, and do you have any mentors that, that kind of helped you develop these skills? Sure. Um, so book wise, uh, I don't actually read a lot of business books. Um, people tell me that my method is very similar to other books, which I think is, I was going to uh, say that I was going to say, yeah. I was thinking traction, traction, traction. Yeah. You know, US. Never read it. Never read it. E-myth. You know, I finally got around to reading that, but the same sort of, or the four day work week, that sort of stuff, it, you know, it's all kind of just, it's the same theory. It's just, what can you pick that's going to make you feel comfortable and help you get to that goal? That being said, I just finished uh, Tommy Breedlove's book, Legendary, which is fascinating in terms of how to build your life around your passions and have financial uh, freedom through that and really being alive when it comes to your profession or your vocation. So I would say lately, you know, the last book would be Tommy's, a legendary, but then as far as mentors, you know, 
I learn a lot from my clients. A lot of my clients are mentors to me. You know, they've accomplished tremendous success and more so than me and like way more than me, you know? And so they've been able to teach me over the years. Um, I had one mentor or still Art Italo, who's kind of in the consulting space for lawyers as well. More theory versus, you know, theory and implementation, which is what I do. Uh, so he helped me, especially at the beginning, you know, I called him right when I went off, went out and he laughed, he goes, so you're my competition. And, uh, I said, yeah, just, can you give me some advice? And he laughed and he gave me advice for an hour and it was so valuable, um, for him to take that time and just mentor me along. And even still, we keep in touch, uh, you know whenever I need some sort of advice or guidance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and those experiences you've had with, you know, over 20 years, you've got to see what works for firms and what not to do. Correct. And those, those are learning experiences too. No, I know there's a lot of, you know, my first firm was family law. And so, and it was high volume family law. And so we saw a lot of divorces. And in my 20s and 30s, people say, well, geez, you've seen 10,000 divorces. Does that make you not want to get married? And I said, on the contrary, it shows me all the warning flag flag leading up to something like that. So what I tell a lot of my clients is I'm the cliff notes. I've seen it almost all at this point. There's not a story I haven't heard. Everyone has the same issues, the same concerns, regardless of practice there, regardless of where they are geographically or age wise or financially, you know, there's, a, it's always, you know, everyone's concerned, you know, so I don't think that changes, but I'm able to get that information, learn those lessons and then share them with everybody else without them having to go through the pain to learn that lesson. Yeah. I can't there. I can't remember the saying it's, it's, if you, learn from your mistakes, um, you're knowledgeable, or if you learn from others mistakes, you're wise. I can't remember the exact (laughs) saying, but that's what kind of comes to mind there. I mean, I, I, since I was little, I always remember, I would love talking to older people, just, just get their insight, you know, just, Hey, what are your shortcuts? What have you learned? And I always felt not that I could, you know, cheat the system, but if I could get this knowledge before I make those mistakes, and the, really, it's a function of time, which means you need experience to to know some of these things. And so if I can find anybody can be a mentor, you know, just what have you learned, but then also share that information with everybody else so that they don't make the same mistakes either. Yeah, I love that. I mean, this is great. It's great tips. And it's like, you know, the people that you're congregating with, that you're hanging out with, if you keep elevating you know, you keep learning new things and, and it, you kind of get immersed in that world. So yeah. uh, I, I love it. So Alvaro, you know, word, yeah, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't know what the saying is, but I think you're the sum of the five people you hang out with the most or something like that. Yeah. And so again, if you surround yourself with people who are always pushing the envelope, Oh, never satisfied, always hungry, you know, that motivates you, it motivates me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Alvaro, this has been amazing. You know, what, what, what questions or stories do we not talk about that you think would be important for our audience? I think, you know, what's going on right now. I've been actually very busy these last couple of weeks um, with what's happening. You know, are we going through another recession? How long will this last? My intakes are down. The phone's not ringing. Do I lay off employees? So I think that's a hot topic right now in terms of how do I deal with what's happening and make my business not just survive, but thrive, right? You want to thrive through this situation. So I think keeping from an HR perspective, keep your team. Um, you're only as, I always say I'm only, only as good as my team. Um, I, the, I got to where I am because of my team. I couldn't have done it myself. And so, you know, don't get in a situation where from a pride point of view, 
you're just keeping everybody on and then you have to lay everybody off in June because you couldn't slow your burn rate, right? Slow your burn rate right now and maybe cut their hours by a day, right? Just, hey, I don't know how long this is going to happen, but for the next two weeks, I, we're not working Fridays. We're slow. We don't have the work. And this way, I want to keep us longer. Look at those monthly expenses that you don't even think about that just come automatically deducted. What can you get rid of right now um, during this time? Always market right now. You know, it doesn't mean just because you can't go to lunch with somebody and just because the conferences are canceled doesn't mean you can, you stop marketing. You know, you just adapt to what's happening. Put a presence out in social media, do live feeds, give, give them tips, but definitely market don't stop right now and again keep keep your core team they're they're important and you don't want to get in a situation where you have to let them go because you couldn't slow your burn rate so i would say right now those are i mean that's a hot topic yeah that that's phenomenal advice because you know we don't know how long this is going to last and everyone that says that they do or you know it's kind of full they're of it they have and- no idea yeah now, if you keep the full staff, you keep them rolling, then then eventually that's going to hurt everyone. And and the same for marketing. You can't just quit marketing because when this ends, you know, your your funnel dries up. And- Correct. So, mar- yeah, marketing, you know, what you do marketing-wise generally comes to fruition three to six months later, right? When I got asked to speak at Avo Lawyernomics, right, they asked me nine months before the conference. I spoke at the conference. And then I was getting clients still nine and 12 months later. So a decision I made two and a half years ago is coming to fruition. And so when people say things are slow, I always say, well, what were you doing for marketing three or six months ago? And so do schedule stuff. I'm telling my clients, you can't go to lunch, call them, call your referral sources and invite them to lunch on June 12th, right? So that when this kind of passes and maybe it's done by May, and the economy's back up in June, you've already got all your June lunches scheduled, right? So, you know, just don't stop. Yeah, I love that. And, and everyone that's stopping, you know, you, you like if it's an auction-based system, you're paying for ads, you know, you're getting a lot better price and you only Correct. pay if there's a click. So, you know, I, I love it. You got to keep marketing guys and, you, but you do have to watch, you know, those unnecessary expenses and, and try to keep your, your core team. Uh, guys, um, we've been talking to Alvaro Aruez, Around. founder of, <laughs> um, I apologize, right. of 3A Law Management, an elite business consulting firm to help attorneys take their practice to the next level. Alvaro, where can people learn more about you? Uh, the website, 3alawmanagement.com. You can email me, 3A at 3alawmanagement.com. You can call me, uh, 404-219-8096, and then just, yeah, just reach out anytime. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thanks for listening to the Rankings Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.